Hi, Jeezy. Hello, what am I? I know, surprise. What am I doing up here at this point? I'm here to sing. No, I'm not, I wish. I, I don't have a very good voice. Yeah. No, here's what I'm here to do. Um, we are about to take communion together. Um, is that money? Okay. Uh, hey, and leaders, if you are in charge of helping out, you can start passing out the elements now. So leaders are gonna bring around a bowl that has the communion elements in it. If you're going to steal this money, we're just gonna take it. They should look like this. It's a little thing. It's got a wafer and some grape juice in it. Uh, and I just want you to know a little bit about what communion is before we take it. So communion is something that Jesus instituted uh, when he was on his way to the cross. And it was, this, it was this practice where early in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, there was this thing called Passover where God's people were being held in Egypt and God made a way for them out uh, through, through the death of the Egyptians. He, he killed the firstborn son of the Egyptians that night and he made a way for his people out through death. For one night, he saved them. And all the way into the New Testament, Jesus shows up and he makes a new way through death for his people forever. And so here's what you do when you take communion, right? These wafers. When you eat the wafer, you're eating it saying, Jesus, this is your body broken for me. Jesus was about to head to the cross. His body was about to be broken for us to be in relationship with him. And when you drink the grape juice, you're saying, Jesus, your blood shed for me uh, because his blood was about to be shed on the cross for you, for the sake of love. As Jesus says, for the joy set before him, he endured the suffering on the cross. For the joy that he had for you, each one of you, Jesus had joy to be in relationship with you again. And so he endured the suffering on the cross for your sake because he loves you. And here's what it says. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it talks about what Jesus did when he started this practice. It says, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. You, you are God's people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. And so here's two things I want to encourage you to do tonight. You can uh, take this in, in just a second. The band's going to come back up and play through a song. You can stay seated. But here's the two things I want you to know. If you uh, are a follower of Jesus, if you have given your life to Jesus, if you have uh, said, Jesus, you are my Savior, I will follow you, then communion is for you. It is a practice that Jesus said in remembrance of what that promise means, uh, you are going to drink this wine, drink this grape juice, and eat this wafer uh, in remembrance of Jesus' love and sacrifice for you. If you don't believe in Jesus, uh, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable at all, but this practice, it doesn't really make as much sense for you, so you don't have to take it. In fact, I would encourage you not to take it, please. Um, only take it if you have decided to follow Jesus, because this is something you're agreeing to the promise that you made with him. And then the second thing I want to encourage you to do is that this is a moment to be serious, right? It's um, These things are kind of a little goofy looking, right? It talks about bread and wine and this is like a little hourglass with a little bit of juice and it's like a piece of styrofoam almost. But the beautiful thing about this is every time we take communion, no matter what it looks like, if we are eating an Oreo and orange juice at home, if we are eating a wafer and grape juice here, uh, communion is coming into union with God. We are entering into union with Jesus. Uh, and when you are entering into union with Jesus, this is what I want you to do as you, before you drink the juice and eat the wafer, um, have a conversation with God. And if there's anything you need to tell God, if there's anything you want to confess or talk about or share, if it's emotions, if it's something you've been struggling with, if it's something you want to tell him that you've been doing that you don't want to do anymore, any of those things, if you uh, need to be reminded that you are loved, all of those things can happen in union with Jesus. And so every time you take communion, we get to enter into union and relationship with God because he made a way through the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood for us to be able to enter into union with our creator. And so the band's gonna come up. They're gonna play one more song uh, and you can take communion whenever you are ready after you have had time to think and you feel like you are ready to take it. You're free to at your own uh, pace. And then when you're done, you can, uh, if you want, come back up and, and sing and finish out the last worship song and then we'll keep going with our night. So band, I hand it over to you. And again, whenever you are ready, uh, after you have spent time in union with Jesus, go ahead and take the elements. Thank you. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stay when everything around me is shaken. I've
We are so thankful for that gift of grace that you gave us through Jesus and that we're able to spend eternity with you through that, Lord. I just pray that you open up our minds and hearts to what it is you have for us here tonight. We just don't forget that sacrifice that you made. Help us just to grow and learn more about you here tonight through the message as well as through small, small group here as well, Lord. For all these things in your name. Amen. Well, GZ, thank you for worshiping with us. You can go ahead and take a seat. Hey, 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 Ground Zero. What's up? Welcome to the best night of the week. I hope that you had an amazing Easter. Happy Easter. Uh, I'm glad that you're here tonight. Glad that you're here tonight. Fist bump, all right? Because it's April. Now, whenever April rolls around, I'm always reminded of something that happened to me on April 1st when I was in middle school like you. So, this is what happened. My dad came home from work one day, and he said, Mark, he was all excited. Mark, I won a contest at work with the Minnesota Timberwolves. I said, that's awesome. Did, did you get tickets to a game or something like that? He said, even better. Kevin Garnett, who was one of the players at the time when I was in middle school, he's going to call our house, and you're going to get to talk to him. He wants to talk just to you. And he was one of my favorite basketball players, Kevin Garnett, the big ticket. Here's a, a picture of him dunking on somebody, all right? He was awesome. Larger than life, okay? And so I went to school the next day and I bragged to all of my friends about how I was gonna get to talk to KG, the big ticket. And so I got home and I rushed to the phone and I sat there just waiting for him to call. And finally, the phone rang, I picked it up, and it was Kevin Garnett's assistant. How cool is that? Like, wasn't even hit. That's a baller move right there. Like, if you have an assistant who calls for you, right, to transfer you, that, that's a baller move. Okay, so 
His assistant says, please hold for Kevin Garnett. And then next thing I know, hello, this is Kevin Garnett. I'm like, whoa, I'm talking to Kevin Garnett. And we had an awesome conversation, all right. I, I told him about how I play basketball and about how I thought, how awesome I thought he was. And I hung up the phone and I had this huge smile on my face because I had just talked to Kevin Garnett. Or so I thought. <laughs> you remember what day it was? April 1st. I walked out of my room and my dad yells, April Fools! And my whole family was laughing at me. You guys. I cried. I'm not kidding. Like, I cried. I ugly <laughs> cried. I did not handle it well, okay? I didn't know how I was going to face my friends. I was so hurt because what I thought was true was a lie. And because it hurt so bad, I never wanted to believe a lie again. Now, my dad pulled a really bad prank on me, okay? But he is a good guy. He is. I just want to make that clear. But did you know, hey, this is real talk, we have a spiritual enemy in life that is not a good guy. And I'm talking about the devil, okay? And he would like nothing more than for you to believe his lies. The Bible actually describes the devil as the father of lies. And the devil knows that if he can get you to believe his lies, he can knock you down and he can discourage you and he can get you to do all sorts of things that will hurt you and harm you if he can just get you to believe his clever little lies. That's why Jesus says this in the book of John. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now, ground zero. I've never seen the devil with my own two eyes, okay? Never been walking down a dark alley at night and all of a sudden been attacked by a red guy with horns and a pitchfork, all right? But I have been attacked by a lie. Here's the reality. The devil probably isn't going to show up in your life but his lies will. I have believed the devil's lies more times than I want to admit. And some of the worst things that I've done, some of the worst decisions I've made have been after I believed a lie. And I bet if we took an honest look at your life, the same would be true for you. But Jesus has good news for you and he has good news for me when it comes to lies. He says this, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's a promise from Jesus. And so are there some lies that you as a middle schooler need to be set free from? I believe that there are. And that's why we're gonna do this series called Clever Little Lies to call out some of the lies that you might be believing in order to set you free. And here is one that the devil might be whispering into your ear at times. Everyone's doing it. You ever heard someone say that? Try to get you to do something. Everyone's doing it. Does that little voice ever come in your head? Well, I mean, what's the big deal? Everyone's doing it. Now, the it there can be filled in with a lot of different things. For example, I remember feeling the pressure to swear and use bad language when I was in middle school because everybody else seemed to be doing that. And I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be like everybody else. And so I used to walk home from school and on the way, we would just let the words fly. I'm not proud of that. I just felt like everyone was doing it. If you think that everyone is swearing and using bad language, you will be more likely to use it too. If you think everyone is cheating on assignments and tests, you will be more likely to cheat. If you think everyone is drinking alcohol underage, you'll be much more likely to try it before it's legal. If you think that everyone's tried vaping, you'll be a lot more likely to do that too. 
It's called peer pressure. So what can we do? What can we do to stop this lie? Well, there's a story in the Old Testament that I think can help us. And it's the story of three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Those are some really fun names, all right? And and King Nebuchadnezzar did something really evil. He made a giant gold statue of himself. Yo soy numero uno. (laughs) And after he built this giant gold statue, he made a law that said any time that musical instruments began to play in the kingdom, everyone had to bow down and worship this giant statue. And anyone who didn't, would be thrown into a burning, flaming furnace. Whee! Psh. All right. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they followed God. And it would have been wrong for them to bow down and worship. But I'm sure that they felt the pressure to do it when everyone else in the kingdom did. But they didn't give in, and they didn't bow down. They didn't give in to the lie that everyone was doing it. So how can we overcome this lie? How did they overcome this lie? I think we can ask a couple questions that will help. And the first one is this. Is it true? Is everyone actually doing it? Middle school can be a tricky time because you want so badly to fit in. You want to be like everyone else or, or at least fit in with everybody else. And that's why it can be difficult to feel like you are the only one. Have you ever felt like you're the only one? Like you're the only one who doesn't have a phone yet. Or you're the only one who isn't allowed to go to the mall or to a movie with your friends. Or you're the only one that isn't allowed to date yet. And some of you, some of you feel like if you stand up and if you do what is right, you will be the only one who's doing what's right. You feel like you're the only one who doesn't swear. You feel like you're the only one who isn't cheating on your assignments. But is that true? Let's look back to our story. Some officials, they go before the king and they give a report on how this musical bow down law is going. And this is what they say. They say, but there are some, but there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. So was everyone doing it? No. The Bible says there were some who weren't. And whatever it is that you feel pressured to do because you feel like everyone else is doing it, I bet there are some who aren't. You are not alone. You're not the only one. There are others who will stand with you for what is good and what is right. Maybe you just haven't found them yet. You need to find your Shadrach, your Meshach. I guess that makes you a Bendigo, okay? But look, okay, as you are looking for them, I want you to ask yourself this question and be honest. Are you one of the some? Are you one of the some who does what is right. You know who one of my son was in middle and high school? It was my friend named Scott, Scotty, okay? He was 6'2", basketball, football player. One time he was on an overnight trip with the football team and our high school, and when they checked into their hotel rooms, some of the guys discovered that there was some really inappropriate stuff on some of the channels that were just provided on the TVs. Before Scott knew it, his room was full of guys that we're watching this stuff. They're like, come on, Scott, just look. Come on, just watch it. Come on, everybody's doing it. It's not that big of a deal. But Scott wouldn't watch. He refused. He said no. And because they kept pressuring him, he actually left the room and just got out of there. 
even though he got made fun of for it. He chose to honor God and not give in to that peer pressure. Scott is one of the some who does what is right even when everyone else is doing what is wrong. And when he came back from that football game, he told me about what happened. And you guys, it inspired me. There were times after that that I walked out of a movie. There were times where I left the room because I knew it wasn't right to watch. And knowing that there were some people like Scott who were doing what was right helped me to do what's right. And so if we want to fight the lie that everybody is doing it, we have to realize that not everyone is actually doing it. And I hope that you can find the sum. But even more than that, I hope that you are one of the sum. The second question to fight this lie is this. If everyone is doing it, does that make it right? A lot of people do a lot of things, but that's not what makes something right or wrong, is it? Now, this might surprise you, okay, but I'm not a person who is really up on today's beauty trends. I know, it's shocking, right? No, that, that didn't take a genius to figure out, okay? But what's really interesting is to look at some of the old beauty trends from like way back in the day, okay? There was this weight loss trend from the Victorian era. You ready for this? To eat tapeworms. Look at this. This is a real advertisement. Eat, 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 and always stay thin, fat. The enemy that's shortening your life is banished. How? With sanitized tapeworms. So the idea was you would swallow a small pill that had the egg of a tapeworm in it, and that little egg would hatch into a parasite that would grow into a full-blown tapeworm inside of your intestines and as you ate your Doritos and as you ate your Pop-Tarts and as you ate your waffles in the morning, that tapeworm would eat some of whatever you ate and that would keep you thin. Eat, eat, eat and always stay thin because of the tapeworm buddy within. There are so many things wrong with this, okay? I don't need to get into it. This was a common trend. This was a common weight loss trend, okay? And look, if everyone started eating tapeworms again, would that make it right? No! Here's the truth, okay? We shouldn't decide. We shouldn't decide what is right and wrong based on what other people do, but on what God says to do. Settle in, I'm gonna say that one more time. I think this is so important. We shouldn't decide what is right and wrong based on what other people do, but on what God says to do. We look to the Bible and we look to the life of Jesus. And that's where we find what is right and wrong. Now, Shadrach, after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down, they were actually called before the king, and the king was furious with them, and he threatened to throw them into that furnace that I talked about if they didn't bow down. But I want you to see what they said. They said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Uh Uh-uh. We're not going to do it. That's some serious courage. And I wonder what gave them that courage. How did they know what the right thing to do was. Well, they lived according to God's word. The Bible, I want you to see Exodus 20, four through five. This was a commandment that these three would have lived by as the people of God. God himself said, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind. And you must not bow down to them or worship them. They had the wisdom to know what was wrong 
and the courage to do what was right. They didn't bow because it wasn't right. They knew it went against God's word that they lived by. And it did not matter to them if everyone else was doing it, they weren't going to. Again, they had the wisdom to know what was wrong and the courage to do what was right. Ground zero. Be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Decide what is right based on the truth in God's word rather than what everyone else is doing at the time. But you're probably wondering, what happened to them? Anybody wondering that? What happened to them? They went before the king, they argued, but they didn't bow down. And so what happened? Well, the king was furious. He demanded that the fire be made seven times hotter than normal. Normal was enough to kill a person. Seven times hotter. You know what happened? Even the soldiers that threw them in were killed by the fire. But that wasn't the fate of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Check this out. This is crazy. The king himself. Look! Nebuchadnezzar shouted. I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. They survived the fire. Because God was with them. And we don't know for sure, but most people believe that that fourth person in the fire was actually Jesus Christ himself. And here's what you need to know tonight. Even if you feel like you are all alone because you're doing what's right, Jesus is with you. So let me close with a question tonight. Where do you need the courage to do what's right? Let me pray and ask God to give you that courage today. God, I thank you for this story. And I pray, God, short and sweet, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to know what's wrong and the courage to do what's right. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, have a great time in small group. And we'll see you next week.